Kia ora and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby Pod. It's the week that Ian Foster has to start making good on being kept in charge, so there's going to be lots of talk about that in the show, about which team should play, how they should approach the Springboks, what could change, and also what could change from the Springboks. In studio as ever, James Parsons, and in Japan, for the first time, Bryn Hall from the Yamaha Blue Revs. Welcome, mm, konnichiwa. <laughs> konnichiwa, boys. Uh, it's definitely uh, good, to, good to see some familiar faces. It's um, it's pretty hot over here. I think 34, 35 degrees is where we are uh, training at the moment. So, uh, But now it's great to touch down in Japan, and um, it's been a great start for the last couple of days that I've been here. They're working you hard? Yep, transitioning would probably be the word that I'd use. Um, yes, yeah, a very long running and... Um, yeah, just probably more so the weather. The weather's just really hot even and humid. So we're pretty lucky that we train in the morning. We get the whole um, morning and afternoon off and then we come in later in the evening. So um, there has been a, a bit of spare time, which has been quite nice. So uh, get my car tomorrow. So it's all go, fellas. It's all going moving forward now. Mate, if you're saying the running's tough, everyone else must be absolutely out on their feet because I've never seen you struggle in a running session ever. Oh, I think it's just the, the the type of running it is. It's not like, you know, I'm used to like high intensity MAS kind of, you know, training, but, um, you know, it's more so just, I think I haven't, we did a 45 minute just running the, the laps of the field um, for, for the end of the session on the Friday. And I haven't done that kind of stuff since I was, you know, since like 2021. So, mate, that's it. And even Wally Rifle, you know, back in our day, Jip, yeah. Wally Rifle kind of training. So, yeah, um, but no, look, my body weight. My body will get used to it, mate, and, um, you know, it's all good. These boys are really good, and uh, trainers have been awesome, and more so the players as well. They've been uh, very, very welcoming. Welcoming, sorry. You're going to come home built like Terry Wright. I'm going to be weighing about 83 kgs, I think. <laughs> um, no, I think we did it. We just did a warm-up session, and my whole my whole shirt was just dripped in sweat, so uh, I'm probably going to lose a couple of kgs. So, But that's pretty good. It's going to be fast running footy over here, so, yeah, I'll get used to it. No, any- I'll probably have some abs like Joe. I have some abs like um, like Jip in the summer. I'm pleased so to hear. I'm, I'm, going for. I'm pleased to hear they're making you earn your money, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What yeah. about the Japanese snacks? Have you got into the convenience stores and found a favourite Kit Kat or anything along those lines? Um, there's a lot of Seven Elevens here. You can pretty much get anything in a Seven Eleven, whether it be um, any type of food. Like uh, you can just get a, a meal that can be hot, that can be microwaved for you there. You can get your bills done there. You can actually get alcohol as well. There's apparently there's a couple of um, um, ones that I need to try, but uh, that'll be at a later <laughs> date. But yeah, you'll be have to. Um, there's just so many things here, so uh, the people are really nice, and um, I've just been saying arigato gozaimasu a lot over here, so and nodding my head. So, uh, but yeah, I'll continue to figure that out um, the longer that I'm here. I put on at least four kg during the 2019 World Cup from 7-Elevens. Just. <laughs> and, and another store called Lawson's. As Sounds well. like he could do with yeah, that diet. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you just need karaage chicken yeah. and a bunch of Asahi Blacks, and that'll get you through no problem at all. That's why I did the 2019 World Cup. Beautiful. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. We've got a few things to nice. talk about that um, aren't convenience stores and uh, you being run into the <laughs> ground. And that's Ian Foster, who in a way has been run into the ground in recent times by the media and a lot of criticism. Obviously, the rugby championship opens up. They start in a very tough fashion with two away games in Mbombela and Johannesburg against South Africa. Starting with you, Jipper, what is the minimum expectation for the All Blacks going into these two games? Oh, I think it would be um, crazy for us to drop our standards and expectation and our expectation as All Blacks, All Blacks fans and anyone involved um, with that team is, is 100%. Um, we don't always achieve it, but that's what makes us continuing to be best. So uh, I think that should still be the, the common goal, and I have no doubt for the playing group and management group, that's what they're setting out to achieve. Is that realistic? Hard to say, but um, it, would be a, it would be a quick turnaround. But I think if there's an adjustment, and, and listening to Jace Ryan during the week, we sort of spoke about it um, last week, is stripping it back and, and probably you know, less is more. Um, and, and some freshening up um, of players. You know, there's always this thing, like, I don't know if you think this, Bryn, but when a new coach comes in or you come back from a major injury, normally your first few performances are like, you're, you're sort of nine out of tens um, because, you know, you, you're on edge and, and you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's. So there could be an element of that to play into it, and, and I have no doubt they won't be overloading them 
um, so they can just get out there and play. I, I personally, and maybe you know, everyone laughs at me always that I'm optimistic, but um, it will be a massive challenge. Always hard to go to South Africa and win, but my belief is we can do it. So, Bryn, considering the All Blacks' form against Ireland, the fact they're in South Africa, is two from two a realistic expectation for them to come home with? Um, I think like what, what Jip said, the expectation for us, um, it shouldn't change. I think any time you put on the All Black jersey, your expectations are to win because, you know, we're just so used to having that high standard. So, um, But I guess for me, it's been able to see the improvements that we saw in that Irish series that we didn't see, um, you know, whether that be through you know, the physicality at the breakdown, which is going to be crucial, you know, your line-out set piece more, which the Irish will be able to get to us and be able to score tries in that, um, in that third test match. So for me, I think... You know, I'd, you'd love for us to win the two test matches, but for me personally, it's been able to see um, the improvements in our game um, and seeing the, the progression through the rugby championship. And look, I know there's going to be a review after the two the two games um, with whatever that is, but you'd like to think that probably um, Ian Foss and that coaching group through the change that they've had from the Irish series, they're going to be there. Uh, but for me, it's just seen improvements in the games where we probably didn't get that right in the Irish and that Northern Hemisphere style. So whether that be with our attack, physicality at the breakdown efficiency getting that and then even our kicking game as well so if we just see slow improvements around our game um, then look for me personally um, that's all I want to see moving forward in the rugby championship just before you jump in there Jip because I can see you just getting ready to jump in that's what the expectations are from an All Blacks point of view how many games do you think they're going to win in South Africa for you Brent? it's hard it's, it's, it's hard to Come say on, mate. Oh, oh. I think they go I think they go 2-0 to be honest and the reason why I say that is there a different style to what they've been playing against the Irish. And this is nothing, no disrespect to the South Africans. Look, um, we know that physicality was, if we don't get that right, you know, we're going to we'll lose test, we'll lose those two test matches. So, you know, if we can win the physicality breakdown and be efficient at that breakdown, then it gives us the best opportunity to attack like we should be and how we do in the past. But just the attacking side, I think defensively, we're going to be able to put more pressure on the South Africans just due to the fact that they don't, they don't play a lot. They don't play a lot as the Irish and they aren't going to ask as much questions defensively um, with how the Irish were because like, they were just ruthless and being able to anim have so much animation for long periods of times in their face play attack when ball was in play. Um, I just think it's going to be a little bit different. So um, I'm going to go 2-0. Look, I'm, you know, I'm going to back the All Blacks, but um, they've got to get a few things right and the things that I've touched on are going to be really, really important. Couple of Patriots, mate. That's very bold. It's a bold call. And you're making the same bold call? Yeah, I, well, I just said that's my expectation. That's, that's what I expect. Um, I, same with Bryn, like the it's going to be hard, it's going to be challenging, but to my points earlier, is if it's stripped back and they declutter and there's a little bit of freshness, which we've already seen, you know, new coaches bring a lot of freshness, but they also bring a lot of edge because you don't know if you're going to be picked or not. Um, that can bring the best out of people. And, and I think, you know, knowing that leadership group, they'll be wanting to make a statement as well. Um, yeah, it is bold. I'd say the South Africans are favourites in terms of, um, you know, betting agencies. Um, but, you know... Pressure makes diamonds. <laughs> so are you going to walk down to the tab and put a bit of money on 2-0? I'm not allowed, but, you know, if I was, yeah. you know, you'd have to jump on. We'll put the house on it. Um, the South African comments in the YouTube sections are also always interesting. Oh, they'll, they'll rip both of us to bits. You guys uh, It's not the down. first time. It's not the first time and it won't be the last. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, uh, that is, I think... No, sorry, sorry, just, Go on. just on that, Ross, like, yeah, we're back, I'm back in the All Blacks around, you know, with you know, what, what they can do. And so, but, you know, the South Africans, you know, if they play to their DNA, which it is, which they put pressure on us last year in, in the test matches, you know, whether they be through their, their line out more, um, the kicking game, I think is going to be really important. And whether they go with Fuff the Clerk or they go with Hendrickson, um, you know, that could be a little bit different because we know that Fuff the Clerk's proven he's got a great kicking game. And when he's kicking well with Hondre Pollard, um, it's their DNA and be able to do that. So, you know, if, if I'm the All Blacks, that's probably one guy that I'm gonna put a lot of a lot of pressure on. Um, Hendrickson, you know, that's not to say he's played really well and, he, and he's deserving of his position in starting, but um, he's not proven. And so, if I'm the All Blacks and you want to put pressure on a kicking game, um, that's where one I'd be targeting around that area. So Stephen Donald agrees with Bryn on targeting the kick strategy of South Africa. Why is it so relevant for you? Well, I think it is relevant for when South Africa win games, they nail their their, their kick strategy in terms of their contestors getting balls back or forcing errors and you know, being able to work their way down the field into that mall zone um, and putting teams under pressure to a style of play they want to play to. And it, and it is definitely a key area to attack. But like I mentioned before, just listening to Jace Ryan's 
comments. Um, you know, he really wants to simplify things for this All Black pack, and a big part of it is controlling what they can control. So the first thing is around kick strategy, they can control the set piece. Can they put them under enough pressure that the South Africans aren't kicking on their terms? They've got the ball bobbling at the back of the scrum, or you know, messy lineouts, so that it puts them on behind the eight ball. Second part of that is breakdown. If they can control the breakdown, or at least you know, sometimes you'll see players go in and out, in and out. It's all to just sort of disrupt that ball at the back for uh, when the nine is kicking or or passing, and then you know, obviously kick pressure, which we see locks do very well. And then fourthly, which I don't think we've done that well, Bryn, is um, that escort game and protecting our back three members to have the best ability of catching their contestable kicks. If we take control of our role in that, as in the All Blacks role, it'll give us our best you know, way of disrupting their kick game rather than trying to say, OK, we're going to stop every kick. It's basically just fo focusing on the simplicities of the game and what you can control to disrupt that kick. So there's a lot of work to be done because a lot of those things are things they couldn't do very well against Ireland. Different team though, a different kick strategy. Like, um, you know, Johnny Sexton does love an attacking kick. You know, like it is, it is different um, in terms of the preparation defensively. It is a different line-out structure. So there are elements that will change. Um, but yeah, all areas that we've spoken about and, and the group themselves and the All Blacks have spoken about, they need to be better at it. But I still think that source is going to be the, the big... If you can stop it at the source, man, you, you just nullify everything. It means the opposition are always going to be slower. Even if they win the ball at line-out or it's bobbling back at the scrum, they're not crisp, the ball's behind, behind them, and it gives you, the with the right tackle choice, it gives you the opportunity to disrupt that ball at breakdown. They don't even get the chance to kick. So can Jace Ryan make that much difference in two weeks, Bryn? Can he really clean all of this up? I definitely think when it comes to the line-out more and the set-piece uh, part of it, especially when it comes to the line-out, um, I definitely think he'll be able to uh, make a difference around that because um, he's proven at the Crusaders and, you know, luckily he's got a lot of guys that he actually knows through the Crusaders to be able to, um, they know what they need to do. So it more so might be upskilling the, the other guys that haven't been at the Crusaders and helping them with around what that looks like. But I think for me, the, that form... It, of the play can be taken care of with Jace, but I think it's more so the general play kicking in as well, whether that be off kickoffs, um, just that kind of no man zone when they're going nowhere and then they're putting up those contestable kicks. I think that's where um, they can make some pay as well. And I think disrupting at the ruck is really important. And Jip, you brought up around knowing your own role, you know, whether that be you have an understanding that you're escorting the person at the winger that's chasing the ball off um, Hendrickson or the clerk. Legally, um, of or course. It's disrupting. Right? Legally, of course. Yeah. If you, yeah, legally, of course. Just in case there's a ref watching, um, you know, we're, we're talking legally here. <laughs> legally, legally. Well, to be honest, no Irish changing lanes. Four or five lanes yeah, no changing lanes. Um, if you watch the Irish, they do it pretty well. But then I think also it's around the ruck as well, Jip. Um, you know, they do make that kind of caterpillar kind of long yeah. ruck. It's pretty important if you're if you're if you're a forward and you have a role around disrupting that. Whether it's taking two guys, pulling them forward, so then it's disrupting the ruck that's not so long then the likes of Scooter Barrett or Sam Whitelock or a, a tall lock or loose forward can then go for the ball and put pressure on Fafta Klerk or um, Hendrickson because we know it's coming. Look, if I know the Irish, they did a little bit of the, the box kicks, not as much as they've, they've been accustomed to with the style of play that they've had, but it's coming with the South Africans. And so um, I think from that, if we get that right, a bit of pressure at the ruck and kick, have those kicks go long, then it's the likes of Will Jordan, Sibby Reese, you know, Geordie Barrett. They can then counter-attack, and I think that's probably where we can make massive gains with the ability of, you know, you look at Will Jordan, his ability to be able to counter-attack off, off long ball. So um, you're not going to get it right all the time, but I think if you can put pressure on them, um, it gives ourselves more opportunities to be able to counter-attack and, I guess, get into our structures and put the, the South Africans under a lot of pressure defensively. You're not going to get it right all the time, but if you consistently do it, you'll have some wins. And it means they're not kicking on yes. their terms. And I think one of the best exponents of it, and he's not there at the moment because he's injured, but it's Ethan Blackadder. Like when he disrupts, uh, you know, from a kickoff, there's normally a box kick or something like, man, you just know it's his role. And he's really good at knowing if he should just charge and try and get them to topple back on each other, or he pulls guys forward and it disrupts the two that are long behind. And then, then that ball's out and you've got to kick it, not on their terms. And he is awesome at that. And if someone can play that role for the All Blacks, um, it'll, it'll be massive and disrupting. You know, in fact, if he does start, like he, he's been dropped probably for the first time. You know, he, he's had a hell of a lot of success, you know, with that mm. World Cup and, and thereafter. So, um, you know, if you can just make any questions in his mind early, if he does start, 
then you know he, he might have some doubts in his game. But also for the young fella that isn't proven yet, if he has a few disruptions, yeah. it puts that sort of extra pressure and, and onus on him and, and it can potentially um, break up his game. What do you think about that as far as what they'll do with their experienced guys? You know, we're hearing that there is still injury problems for uh, Franz Steyn and Dwayne Vermeulen. So do you see a massive change for the South Africans in the team that took on Wales? I don't think massive, but I think those guys come into it. Maybe Franz Steyn, maybe not as much, because I thought Willie LaRue was really strong off, off, the, off the bench. Um, and Willemsa really came of age as well. So maybe, you know, but he could... Um, because Willemsa can go to first five, he could play a role with Willie LaRue on the bench. Um, Dwayne Van Mullen, if he's anywhere near fit, I'd get him in there, personally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the only positions for me, really, because um, I think Ch uh, Colby's out, isn't he? He's got an injury. He could possibly be out. Yeah. So uh, you've got Fussy or Kurt, Fussy or Kurt Lee, who played in that, that, that second, the second text match. Um, against Wales, but then you know the possibility of Fafta Clerk or Hendrickson was probably the one for me. Um, we'd, me and you, Jip, we'd have Malcolm Mark starting, but I think he must be that super sub. That's just how they he's see him. He's just too good at it. That's um, his probably, problem. Yeah, that's it. So, um, but no, I don't think it's going to change a lot from that third Test match. I think um, they'll take some confidence from winning that, and then knowing that you know there, there's a wounded All Black um, team that's come over to South Africa and. They're probably right there for the for the taking and thinking that you know what uh, we're going to put our best fifteen out and that that last test match was probably there close to it their best fifteen. The All Blacks, on the other hand, they've got a few injury woes. Do you think there's a chance that we'll see Fletcher Newell go in there as injury cover in the front row? I think Lomax is with the squad as mm -hmm. well, and obviously Angus is still standing down, or has he missed? Reed, his... No, he's got um, red card, red card, isn't he? Yeah, I know. So yeah. is he still missing games? So yes. you'd have to think he's going to be there somewhere. Yep. Um, and it's either the old adage of, um, you know, sometimes it's easier just getting them out there and getting them into it and mm -hmm. just rip in and then bringing the experience guy off the bench. But then, you know, with such a big test and, and a lot on the line. Um, but I think he's clearly got a coach that knows him very well and believes in his skill set. So you wouldn't be surprised if he's in starting or that match day 23. Yeah, having Jace Ryan in there for a young crusader to come in after only a couple of years of Super Rugby in South Africa is probably, yeah. you're right, very good I, for him. I think it would be unfair for us to, um, you know, and, and I've had this conversation with a few people over the last week, is is thinking he's only there because Jason Ryan knows he's a good player and had a lot to do with him crusader. Like, he did perform very well for you guys, didn't he, Bryn? Um, even, you know, not just his scrummaging, but... His, his effort to get around the um, corner and, and take some tough carries um, against some big opposition and, and physical opponents. I think he's, he's got a lot more to his game than just, just his core basics. I mean, you'll probably know it more, Bryn. Yeah, he is, mate. Um, obviously, a really good scrummage and good at set piece, but he's actually very mobile for yeah. you know for a big man. I think he's he's pretty quick. I think you know he's one of the, probably the faster um, guys in the team when it comes to the first 10 metres. Um, and so he's pretty explosive and look he, he's, got, he's got a great work ethic and he works off the ball which is really important and has a, has a pretty good skill set considering that he's a, he's a big man which you know you need um, in this day and age uh, we talk around the Irish props and how they can have that ball ability uh, Fletch has the ability to be able to do that so you're right Jason Ryan knows him um, hence the reason why he's, he's over there it helps sorry having Jason Ryan there knowing what Fletch can do but um, he's based on his merits and what he can do for you um, you know I wouldn't be surprised if he's, if he's named in that 23 against um, the first test match yeah, we've talked a lot about what the All Blacks need to do without the ball. What about what they do with the ball? Obviously, Brad Moore is gone. Ian Foster is now looking at the attack again. I suppose the question I have for you is, under Brad Moore, how much different were they doing things to when Ian Foster was in charge of attack in 2019? And so, based on that, can we really see much changing over the next two weeks? Well, I think we've discussed a lot since Brad Moore got in there that there were um, a lot of different, around probably more set-piece strikes would that be right Bryn would that be fair I don't want to put words in your mouth um, but not too much in phase play we've seen a little bit of a shift in phase play early on um, in the Irish series and actually throughout the whole Irish series but it was it was used really really well in the, the first test um, but I, I think the, the key changes again is stripping it back and, and simplifying it and, and being really clear on what you're trying to achieve so first things first we need to win our set piece you know scrum and line out needs to be operating operating at 90 plus probably to beat the Springboks in South Africa. And then winning quick ball breakdown. So being clear on your carries, probably not going to your tips or your release passes early, 
probably just looking to go direct early and really suck in the defenders and take that challenge on. Not T-boning, obviously trying to get with a bit of footwork, but you know, limiting that, um, I suppose, that error rate that we saw that uh, that was so crucial in, in some of the, the especially test two and three. And then once you get that, you get quick gain line ball. Defense is going backwards, so you're not going to feel that rush D pressure. So again, it's two areas where you're controlling something else that impl uh, um, affects the, the defenders getting back on side to go for a rush. If it's slow ball, they get time to set and they will rush. And then it's reading that. Okay, it's slow ball. I'm, I'm sounding like some sort of first five here, so you can correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong. But if it's slow I ball, going, if you're slow ball, you can get some depth and know that that line speed pressure is coming. And if you can't get it through the hands, then you know both tens, whether it's Bowden or Richie, have a great cross field kicking game and attacking kicking game. But also, I, I, I still harp on that the contestable off 10, England used it really well. When we did it, uh, it, it did work. There was a couple of knock-ons um, towards Leicester's wing, but it, it's really effective and, and it means the defence is going to have to make adjustments if they are been affected in those modes and then obviously if it's quick ball run flat and fast like we naturally do and see and then it's a little bit easier to pick teams off and or put one in behind if the fullback comes up. How did I do Bryn? Mate, great analysis Jip. Unbelievable. <laughs> great work. You should have been a 10 mate. You should have been a 10 uh, hooker. I just enjoyed food um, too just much. Just like you, <laughs> you probably touched on all those all those points mate which we're probably um, looking but I guess for me and seeing for the All Blacks attack, it's more so just them all being aligned, Chip. And I think, um, you know, whether that be, we've got our pod system that we have, whether we want to hit the third guy or we want to hit the middle guy and being able to go through and clean really well, like you've touched around around our breakdown and being efficient at that to get quick ball. But I think it's off that, you know, it's been able to give the guys like Bodie and Richie the opportunity to be able to come around that corner, off that off that release pass, and being able to go hard at that, that third or that fourth or fifth defender with the two guys outside them running holes and being a really genuine option off that and so i think that's one part that, I, that i'd love to see to be able to um if we can do that consistently like the irish where we're always asking us questions and then from that if we hit those rucks where out, it goes out the back and we hit those forward runners off richie or bodu it's then what's next after that what does that look like how can we ask questions of that defense for the second or third phase but off that you know so don't you think they have to read that off the breakdown speed do you know what i mean like if, if they keep it really simple early and they're direct and the, the breakdown's quick, they're going to be able to play that round the corner game. But if, if they lose the collision, say Etzebeth gets one of his big hits, then do you think in their game plan it should be like, all right, let's get some depth and we're going to a um, contestable kick? Or rather than just sending yeah. um, forwards round again to then potentially get... Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like reading that speed of the breakdown seems to me as a really key um, gauge of how we need to attack. Yeah. I think if like if it is slow ball and we don't have the ability to win that contact, then I think your point around having contestables off ten to be able to put pressure because you've got a full defensive line, it's going to be pretty hard to be able to tackle that. I think that's a, that's a great option. It's more so when we even if we're coming around the corner and we're winning that physicality and breakdown, if you're not aligned around your face play shape and you don't have the the animation around a down line off the the second the second forward or the third forward or you know it's a second pivot, you know Richie or uh, Bodie come around the corner. A quick shift to the second five, Davy, whoever it is. It's the movement and the animation off that where I think, you know, in that Irish test series, we weren't all on the same page. We weren't running the same lines and continually questioning the the Irish defense. The Irish defense, like you look at Sexton and a lot of those phases when, um, you know, they hit the they hit the forwards, the three forwards, and they went out the back, and they went into that breakdown. They got quick ball in the middle of the field. Sexton went the same way, and they had two lines, and they hit Bundy Key out the back, and Leicester bit in, and they went around him. But that's the kind of examples that I'm using around, I think, it, when we played the Irish, we didn't get that right. We had guys that were running the, the wrong lines. We weren't been able to get in the right space. And so it was much easier to defend. And so I guess what that comes back to, it's been able to set first and see what's in front of you. And then you've got to be able to communicate from the outside in to guys like Richie, to guys like Davey, to be able to understand where the space is, you know, whether that be an attacking kick chip, you know, whether it be get into Davey's hands and he can kick a long 50-22 or he can kick a little grubber in behind. But... It's got to be able to be, the team has to be set first. Yeah. You've got to be able to then put communication into you so then you can be able to ask questions, which I just probably don't think we've got that right um, against the Irish series. So that's probably an improvement that I think we need to have, like the Irish, when they always continue to ask us questions around the face play shape. Yeah, and I think probably what I was trying to say is we tried to do that off slow ball, and that's why a guy's lines were missed and the animation wasn't there because everyone's a little bit stagnant. 
and it's always a lot easier when you when you get set and you know the ball's presented like it is at training but it's just having that you know that go to clarity and and stripping back the menu or the options in your phase play and going okay if it's slow ball we're going to that and everyone knows that the kick chase is there or or it's a cross field kick or um, it is Davy doing a 50 22 um, but you know, you can plan all week, but I still think like this breakdown and the simplicity in terms of the skill set needed early on to get some ascendancy and confidence back in the group is critical. But also having the confidence that hey, they're going to win some collisions. Like <laughs> you're coming up against some of the biggest men in world rugby, they will win some. So what is it we're going to off that? And and I just mm. believe they can do it because I've shown it time and time again in some of the best players in the world. Yeah. Just a lot, just just to finish up on that, Jip. Like, it's been able to like for a week. It's been able to prepare prepare for that. So hmm. you know, you'd have to think the South Africans, right? They're going to bring a lot of line speed through AM and their, their wing is staying high. So it's been able to prep through the week. Like you know, for the example that I used with the face play shape, for example, when we were at the Crusaders, we knew for that week that they, if they were going to come high, we needed to race inside shoulders. And so whether it was a forward or a back, you always knew that you had your mindset and your preparation that off that face play, whether it be off one, if it's off Bodie or Richie, or if it's off Davey with the second pair of hands, you're always having a downline because that puts that checks the winger and you can either hit 100%. him, be able to go forward, or you can go out the back, or you can bridge. So you've got to consistently, that comes back to preparation and understanding what that might be through the week. So I'd like to think that we're, that's probably what we're going we're gonna to see through the All Blacks, their ability to be able to have that downline runner to really check AM and check their wingers so then you know they might have to hold off and then it gives you the ability to be able to go out the back and then be able to do the bridge pass and really slow that line speed down. So like you, like you said, Jip, you're not always going to get it right, but if you continue to keep asking them that, all it might take is two or three times, bang, 100%. you're through on that short ball or you're out the back or you're a bridge. So, and that's what it takes. Um, you know, that's what I'd like to see, hopefully, um, with these All Blacks coming forward for this next two matches. Do you think that, you know, like I'm saying from a forwards perspective, let's maybe put the tips and the inside ball away um, and just be direct early. Am I correct in thinking, and I may be um, wrong here, but what I feel like you're saying is let's just have one way of running a face play shape that gives me four options off maybe the first or second ruck that is going to ask mm-hmm. questions and they're eventually you know, maybe going to make the wrong decision and we're going to make the right one in terms of what option we use. 100%. Yeah. That's, yeah. Absolutely, Jim, 100%. Well, I'm acting like a front rower. It just took a while, but, you know, I got there. I got there looking after my fellow front rowers out there. Some of the smartest men in the game. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. <laughs> um, tell me, the way that the South Africans approach defence in comparison to the way that the Irish approach defence, are they going to show a lot of different pictures or do they have a similar approach to the way that they D up? Fairly similar, but I would say um, the Irish are really good around their decision making at breakdown time for turnovers Um, and I think that's throughout the 80 minutes you know whether to enter and waste a body or let's spread the field and have another body so that we can come up and and rush where the Springboks are really good is late in games when guys like Marks and Quagga Smith come on and that's 60 to 80 when you know normally the game's in the balance I reckon that's the period they're the best at in terms of being disruptive defensively at that defensive breakdown because those boys are fresh and just so good and focused on one role and that's normally to get turnovers. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a hard, like they're going to see the similar pitches, yes, but it comes in different waves against the spring box, I believe. It is a little scary to see a bench like that come on, especially in the front row when you consider the stocks that the All Blacks have got down at the moment, Bryn. Oh, well, you know, look at last year in the Rugby Championship, pretty much, you know, just after half time and they were subbing their whole their whole front row you know so um that's how much kind of depth that they've got in their in their four in their front row at, at the moment and so but that doesn't say that the all blacks can't do that you know um you know when you're when you wear their all black jersey you know there's an expectation on yourself and you know that you've got to be able to go out there and perform so um yep yeah, that's a very massive strength that the, that the south africans have and i think like like um you know gypsy when you, when you can bring marks and you know those other boys that um that are pretty much exactly the same as the starting front rowers. You can have, you know, you can interchange them with how much depth they have there. Um, it's a scary thought, but look, um, it's a challenge. And I'd like to think, I know um, Jason Ryan will be, um, will be putting on them those boys to be able to front up and um, we'll strip it right back, give them a clear process and a clear goal. But um, you know, 
it'll be a great um, encounter for those boys that are going to be able to test and, and test themselves against, you know, arguably one of the best front rowers and the front rowing teams in the world. One of the biggest talking points this weekend will be the red cards. We see them every week now, yellow cards, red cards, and Sanzar's made the decision to go with a 20-minute red card, go against the way that World Rugby's going, and continue this trial. Now, they've been, you're giving it the big clap. Not everyone's giving it the big clap. Uh, the concussion prevention groups are saying, no, this is a terrible idea. Nigel Owens has come out and said, this is a terrible idea. We're looking at entertainment before safety. <sighs> you've given it the clap. I know you've stood on this until now. Um, do you still stand in the same place? Oh, look, I, I think, you know, this is from my opinion. I'm not a doctor. Um, and, and probably an area that I'm naturally sensitive to, like I had to leave the game because of concussion symptoms and still have them to this day. But I don't think it is detrimental to player safety because you, you're still going to suffer consequences. And mm. you get that 20 minute red card, that player can't come back on then they've got to go to the judiciary. So I'm not too sure why, um, you know, if anything, did we not see a red card in test two and then a yellow card in test three? Do you know what I mean? Like, are we talking about players say that should have been a red card, should it not? Mm -hmm. uh, like, so, so to me, the 20 minute red card doesn't take away from the spectacle. Yep, that it is about that element of it, but I don't know, 20 minutes is, is a long time and the fact that that could be a key player that can't come back on, um, yep. I, I just, I think the 20 minute red card's a good thing. It's just, it's a personal view, but it's not a medical view. Mm. Like, I, I, I'm not a doctor and I don't understand why if a player goes off for 60 minutes and, you know, versus 20 minutes is about player safety, I, I just can't, I don't understand that. Yeah, well, your thoughts, Bryn? Yeah, on with Chip, more so like the medical side of it, you know, there's really no no difference. But I think I think just having the twenty minutes is just so much is so much better. You know, like that player can't come back on, you know. So, you know, you know, let's say it's an Artie Severe or it's a Bowden Barrett, you know, they get injured, they can't come on. But it doesn't take away from the spectacle of being able to, you know, for fans to be able to say, um, you know, we want to see a fifteen man contest, we want to be able to get um a competitive a competitive game. And so um, I am a big fan for it because um I think the 20 minutes is long enough for the for the team that's been able to try and um, score score points from that. It's enough time for them to be able to influence and been able to get um, a, an advantage from having that 20 minutes off. Um, and so, um, oh, yeah, for me, it's just a yeah. I know it's there's a a lot of people might think it's 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 wrong, but for me personally, I, I love the idea of having 20. I just think it doesn't take away from the spectacle. It gives the the opposing teams enough opportunities to be able to influence and score points through that time and then they get to be able to come back on and then you as an attacking team as well you get to be able to go back to 15 and try one a, a test match in a way for 15 men and you talk about um you know player safety like hate to go back to it but Brody Talek broke a cheekbone it was if that was a 20 minute would it be this you know yellow card with a new call about absorbing force or whatever or was that a 20 minute red card do you know what I mean? So, like, there's arguments both ways. I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. All I'm saying is I see the elements um, that are positive for our game that is struggling to get fans engaged. Mm. And there's an element mm. of it as well that I still think looks after player safety. I don't think either is mm. perfect in player safety. The, the, the solution to it is dropping your tackle height. Yeah. You know, like we've spoken about, and England are the best at it. And they're the best at the breakdown at the moment. Yeah. And just and just on that, I know probably World Rugby want to go back to that. Um, you know, whenever you get a red card, you're off for the whole game because they haven't seen enough change and been able to. Um, they probably seen an red increase. Cards. I understand. You've probably seen an increase, but I think there's actually been a lot of work behind the scenes to be able to have those conversations. Where I think earlier on in my career, you know, we didn't really talk around your tackle technique. We talked around it a little bit, but not to the to the point where it is now. It's like you need to get your tackle point right, and guys are. Guys are trying to change the level. We're, change, we're, we're training at different levels, trying to not get that. Even like the assist tackler, because the assist tackler is probably the most um, one that's getting the red card because they've got to be able to stay high and the first person's chopping. And that's probably the people that are getting it wrong at the moment. But the conversations, the, the change of habits, they're happening at, um, at, at, at our level. So I think in a couple more years' time, I think you're going to see a lot more efficient efficiency when it comes to the tech area i just think i hope to think that world rugby they probably won't because they're going to go back to what they think they haven't seen enough improvement around it but 
I know for us as players, we're making the improvements and we're trying to get that tackle tackle lower. We probably think three to five years ago, we weren't looking at it that seriously to be able to try and get it that right because um, it wasn't massive. But I know now um, it's, it's massive. And so I, I think we're going to continue to keep seeing improvements around tackle technique and it's, and it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Just hope we'll, hope we'll rugby. Um, don't lose faith in that. I've done a full 180 flip on this. I argued with you guys while I was blue in the face last year and this year about the fact that I felt there needed to be a bigger deterrent. I think what I've learned this year is that it doesn't matter what the deterrent is because none of these players are intentionally doing anything. Angus Ta'aval is in a position which he just couldn't get out of the way. It happened too quickly. When I look at it and I think, OK, so if it's happening no matter what the rule is, then surely we have to think about the spectacle as well because it's happening either way. So why do this crackdown for a full 80 minutes and, and ruin the game and the fans are up in arms and everyone's hating all these red cards and everyone's saying it's getting soft, it's not totally winks, blah, 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 blah. We just have to accept that this is going to happen come what may and it doesn't matter whether you go back to you can be sent off in the first minute for 79 minutes. It just doesn't matter. No, but I, I still go back to, I think we get fixated around the cards when the solution isn't whether it's 20 minutes or... 80 minutes. Do you know what I mean? The solution is in, in technique or as Bryn says, the assist tackler has approached because you do have to stay high um, and that's why that being clear on what defenders tackle choice go to is like England seem to have at the moment is a real low focus which doesn't mean the assist tackler has to get involved. The assist tackler is straight on the ball so there's no chance of that shoulder but if someone's not that way inclined and you're caught on the inside and they're still high, you have to, as the assist tackler, really drop your height. Um, but it's not an easy thing to do in split seconds. Mm. Um, and I'm not making excuses, as I say, like I'm sensitive to the topic having left the game myself, but it, it's, I, I just don't understand why 20 versus 60 is medically safer. Yeah. yeah. If anything, you could look at it, and I'm, I'm getting off track here, but <laughs> 15 versus 15 means there's not 14 players trying to cover one player that could lead to other incidents. I don't know. I think it's important because, you know, the information's been, it's been given to us. It's, it's, we've got a pretty clear understanding. Like, well, let's just take away the, obviously, this, we're talking about the red card scenarios around, more so around tackle choice or tackle heights and being able to get that wrong. It's the best team that can be able to adapt for that. When you talk around England, you know, they've adapted the best at it. So, now, very rarely are they getting red cards to be able to because they're getting their, their technique wrong or their tackle choice selected. So, I think moving forward, it's yes, you know, world rugby, you know, they'll they'll bring in little things here and there, but it's on the players, it's on us as players to be able to get that technique right because the information's been given to us. If you go anywhere near the head, whether it be shoulder, your swinging arm, late going to the ground, you're going to get a red card. So, going into the rugby world cup, it's going to be the team that's been able to adapt to those rules because it's not like it's just happened in 12 months. We've been told this for probably the last you know, three to four years around the red card and how much it's going to cost you if you don't get your technique right. So I think moving forward, whether it be the All Blacks or whatever team it is, you've just got to be able to adapt and you've got to get your technique right. And that comes back on the training pitch, being able to get your preparation right, what that looks like, your tackle technique with your defence coach and, and keep just hammering it because um, you know I'd hate to think, I don't want to say this, but it probably will happen in 20, you know, at the Rugby World Cup in a semi-final or final, there's going to be a red card and we're going to be talking about it through the form of um, bad tackle technique. You know, so that's why I think the 20 minutes, because I've contradicted myself here, but, you know, if there's a, you know, and say in the first couple of minutes, there's, you know, an Angus Tart of our situation, you know, and you lose a World Cup because he's gone for 77 minutes, you know, so, um, but adapting and being able to get that right, I think us as players, we have to take accountability around that loss and I think it's pretty important. I think I just argued against myself though as well like if we keep using England as the example but they've been under the sanction and premiership of you get it wrong mm. you've gone for the whole game yeah. so I've just been sitting here thinking probably using England as an example it hasn't helped my argument but that's what I'm saying like you I, I, it's not one or other mm. it's just more about trying to keep working at finding a solution that you know solves that issue but also keeps our game our game yeah. Jeez, that, we, we got down a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, just, it's just an impossible issue because so there is no real science to it. Yeah. Stuff happens yeah, in a game of rugby. But it's also there's no one across the whole game that's not trying to find a solution either. 
Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like everyone uh, knows it's there, everyone's aware of it, and everyone's trying to do everything possible um, and, and do as much work to, to find the solution. And, and it's from a player's point of view on the grass. You know, you've got a current player trying to take accountability, there'll be coaches the same, and then there's the wider organisations and associations as well. So, um, not saying that it's solved, but there's, there's a lot of manpower going in to try to solve it. Now, another major talking point this week, not that we haven't talked about Scott Robertson enough in the last couple of weeks, <laughs> uh, <laughs> went on with Jim Hamilton on the, the Big Jim show and talked about his future, um, his coaching future. He'd like to win two World Cups, one with New Zealand and one with another country. Um, is that an alarming thing for NZR to hear him talking in that way at this time? I think it's pretty smart from him, to be honest. I think he's just keeping his keeping his options open, and so um, yeah, I think no different. I think he touched on in that in that podcast around no different from players. You know, if, if an opportunity is in there, you've got to be able to look at other avenues to be able to um, continue your career. So, um, and you know, it's not automatic that Ray will, will get the job. You know, so whether that you know that first tenure is him going to England. You know, Eddie Jones is leaving in twenty twenty three. And if you got the opportunity to go coach England and been able to um, you know try to win a World Cup then, and then been able to possibly come back to New Zealand, but you never guarantee to get an opportunity in New Zealand because um, you know there's um, you know, very rarely do they get rid of rid of coaches for ten years usually a uh, two World Cup campaigns. So um, I think Ray is playing the game as you should as a player and even as a coach as well. He's playing the game and um, putting them on notice because you know look he's probably the most hottest ticket when it comes to coaching. So you know if we don't want him. You know, I know England or you know some other teams would would be chopping at the bit to get a, a guy like Razor and um, and been able to get him to coach their country. A man with his record, you'd have to back him, mm. wouldn't you? <laughs> man, there's there's not a trophy that he hasn't committed to that he hasn't won. Like that's pretty mm. amazing to be able to say that. <laughs> yeah, it's um mm. yeah, it's pretty impressive, and and I think that's why why he's such an infectious person to be around um, in these environments is because he's got an ambition himself and his ambition to be better mm. every day um, for whoever he's uh, a part of to be better. You can see his whole outlook is, is optimistic, positive and all mm. his energy is focused on um, you know, what he's in at the moment but also where he wants to get to. And just on that, I think one of the things that, um, that makes race so good, you look at his, his resume, you know, he's won six championships with Crusaders but what he always brings into for the year, it's how do you, how do we evolve? How do we continue to get better? How do we not get, how do we keep, um, you know, moving the pendulum? How do we keep getting better and be able to keep a step ahead of, of other teams? And so he continually always has that in his mind. So like when you've got that kind of, um, you know, that mindset, say, how can we make that 1%? How can we be better? How can I, how can I grow this group? How can I, how can we win another championship? We can't be the same. And so, um, you know, like when you've got that kind of ability, and understanding as a coach, um, it's so infectious, and you look at the results from it. So, and I know international rugby is a completely step up, but um, like you said, Jip, um, he's proven everywhere he's gone, he's won, he's won, he's won. So he's doing something right, and you know it'll be a loss, it'll be a shame if we, um, you know, if we don't get him in New Zealand and he's coaching another team, and you know he's winning a World Cup with another team, that'll be pretty tough um, to watch if that uh, if that, if that ends up happening. I think it's worthwhile noting that he's done it with a number of assistants as well, but he's the common denominator. Because yes. sometimes it's like coaching groups, and and you know, but he is a common figure in that success. But he has surrounded himself with many different, um, mm -hmm. you know, assistants, and he's got the best out of them. That they've all gone on to bigger and better things as well. And then he's, you know, I think it's uh, James Marshall he's brought in um, for the Crusaders yeah. and and seeing what he's done at Tasman and things like that. Like he, he, I don't know, he just seems to bring the best out in not only the players, but the, the people around him as well. He, he understands, he understands his weaknesses. And look, when you've had that much success, you can probably afford to be able to get complacent and think, you know, I've, I've clocked coaching, I, I get what we need. But he's always, um, whatever his weaknesses are, you know, he talked around in the podcast, he's a visionary. Um, you know, he thinks around, he's not a, he's a great starter, but he's not a great finisher. And so he brings people around him to be able to uh, complement him with his weaknesses around what he doesn't do well. And so, you know, look at the likes, he's done, like you said, he's done it with different kinds of coaches. You know, Ronan O'Gara was someone that um, at the time when, when he was announced, you know, we thought, oh, that's completely different. No other, no other 
club really ever has got someone from the Northern Hemisphere to come to New Zealand and coach um, and been able to do that. But at the time, he thought, you know, with how Rog thought of the game and he completely changed our game, completely changed our mindset around defence and been able to improve. And so then, you know, he did that and then he brought, you know, Tommy Allison in, he's brought Andrew Goodman in, Leo McDonald was there in the first year in 2017, Brad Moore. So, um, look, Jason he can do it with any form of coach. Jason Ryan, obviously, who's, who's now moved up to the, to the All Blacks. And so um, it just adds to his resume that he can do it with other coaches. He, he knows what he needs and he's got a clear direction around his, his weaknesses and he can get other people to be able to, to help towards that because he's got the great, he's got a great mindset and a great, his biggest strength is bringing players together and a culture and a mindset theme for the year. That's what he does best. And so, um, yeah, like I said, it'd be a shame to see him go if he doesn't get the job for the All Blacks in the next coming years. The startling thing about that list you just rattled off of the assistant coaches is that a lot of them are so fresh they've barely got any experience at a Super Rugby level as a coach, and yet they've come in and done the business. So he's he's obviously got an eye for talent. I, I do think as well, um, if you look at the teams he's coached, he's got some great senior leaders. Like it all plays, but he's he he's the one that's plans a squad and manages that as well along with the assistants but it does play a big role um, I, I think you'd have to agree your senior leadership group Bryn, is, is massive in terms of the week um, and, and how the year and weeks are structured and it would have been no different in Canterbury probably no different at the under 20s yeah and, and that's the really good thing that he that he does you know you know with our leadership group when we were in there um, you know it was really important to be aligned and so, you know, the coaches would go away, they'd do their review and um, their preview and say, how do we get better? What does it look like? And then you know, us as senior leaders would catch up on a Monday and would say, what do we think we need to get better? And then we'd come together. And the best thing about Ray is he's just, he's open to be able to um, have our, whatever we, whatever we think or what the feel of the group is, he's open-minded enough to be able to, to then, you know, he, they might think a completely different thing as coaches, but, you know, hearing from the players and having that, that feel and that, t- and that understanding of what we need, I mean, he can then report back and, and alter things around what our week m- might look like or the, the tour that we're going on. So um, it plays a big part, Jip. Yep, obviously Jip, oh, not Jip, um, obviously Ray um, is the, the spearhead of that, but there's so much around the assistant, the coaches and, and the players all being aligned and then going to form to a, a common goal, which is which is powerful when you've got all those powers that be um, connected and moving forward towards um, a common goal. So you've got this guy who's incredibly ambitious, has proven himself in every way possible as a coach. And he says he wants to win with your country and another country. Do you let him win overseas first or do you let him win with you first? That's the big question for NZR. Which one does he win with first? Yeah, and I think timing's going to play a part in that. You know, you, he may have made his mind up. It's not just on NZR to make a decision. Mm. He, he may have you know, decided that he wants to do it a certain way. So I, I think the timings of that discussion, but also um, being respectful to the current management group is, is, is really critical. So it's a fine line and, and a tough position that NZR find themselves in. It's going to happen in 2023 or 2024. It's going to happen like very, very soon. So they don't have much time to think no. about the hottest talent in coaching in world rugby. He was an agent. Well, yeah, here's an example. Yeah, I'll take a cut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a big cash coming. <laughs> If Ian Foster and the coaching group that are there now, if they win a Rugby World Cup, then Razor's not going to get the job, is he? Oh. So then, you know, it's it's another four years that he's going to have to wait. If you're in Foster and if you win the next Rugby World Cup, wouldn't you be like, I proved you're wrong, I'm out? Wouldn't, isn't that what you'd do? <laughs> Mic drop. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who knows? Who knows? You know? Yeah. Who knows? But, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll just have to wait and see. It's not the Rich and Wong of and Barrett anymore. It's the Razor yeah. and Fozzie. Yeah. That, that's right. Hey. And, and the split is not even. <laughs> the split's the opposite to the Richie versus yeah. Bodie scenario, isn't it? Um, the, the country's well and truly on one side from what you read. Nani Lamape. Now, here's a guy who has been a source of contention for a lot of New Zealand fans. I know that certainly on this podcast, we were massive advocates for him in and around his All Blacks career. And... He has gone to France in 2021. He's at Stade Francais. There's a bit of chat about whether or not he's going to stay there based on whether or not his performances have been up to what he's being paid over there. He's come out and had a crack at NZR. And he said they never gave him a shot. He was, by the coaching 
um, panels admission, the form midfielder, but he didn't fit what they wanted. They offered him a pay cut, and so he took big money in France and left. He's obviously very bitter about it. Is this a good way to play this game? Well, Bryn, you're a current player. What do you think? Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Left it through to the keeper, and uh, then you're the keeper. How would you play it, mate? Um, <laughs> I'm retired. My boots are uh, well and truly up. <laughs> um, well, look, I think that that's how it's it's how Nani feels, you know. So like, that's not what what I would do, or someone else might be different. They might do it in a different way. They might do it as how, how Nani's done it. But um, look, I think he just he, he cares. He cared about you know being the All Blacks and. You know, at that time, you know, if he would have thought that he was the former midfielder, and he played such good rugby during that. Um, he actually left a, he left a comment. I read his comment around from like 2017 to the time that he left. Um, he was, um, you know, arguably the best twelve in the country, and so for whatever reason, it, it just didn't click at the at the New Zealand level. Um, and so, whether that through that it's through coaches or not given opportunities, he he probably felt that that was the case. Um, but you know, the worst thing that he's done, he, he's gone to La Francais, and he's made that decision. He decided to leave. You know, if he's probably if he stayed, you know, I look at all the midfielders that we have here at the moment. He's one guy that can get that um, advantage line to be able to get over the advantage line and, and be a big ball carrier, which, you know, that's his biggest strength and probably what we were missing and what we're wanting, and one of our twelves. But you know, with the with the midfielders that we have, they all have different array of skills, whether that be distribution, kicking, um, running, um, all various all, all variety of twelves and thirteens you know in the country at the moment. But I think. If he wants to come back, you know, I think it's, it needs to be done pretty soon because you know, there's a Rugby World Cup one more year, but um, there hasn't been a decision around who the 12 or the 13 is yet, has there? We'd like to think that moving forward, um, it's going to be, um, that story's going to be told and we're going to have a pretty clear understanding around who that's going to be moving forward through the Rugby Championship. But um, look, if he wants to come back, um, you know, he's he's more than willing to, but I think he's burned a few bridges, unfortunately, with the way he's come out. So whether he would be able to be in the team. I'm not too sure. But what do you think, Jip? I've got no... <laughs> well, well, I, I agree. We did, we did single him out through that period of talking about the midfielders before he left and, and, and spoke about, you know, the strengths to his game, but also how much effort he was putting on in, in the work-ons on his game. He was really trying to up his kicking game. Um, mm. You know, you'd have to say his work rate, he always got on that backfield brin to add an extra number in terms of counter-attack. He got on that edge. Um, so I think none of that's changed, and and so from a skill set point of view, um, I, I certainly think he could come back and and do the business. Um, but you know, me personally, I wouldn't let this play out publicly because it means shows like this start um, talking about, it, and I'm sure there's many others around the world. Um, and and also, um, you know, we don't know the whole story. So you know, and it's not like NZR are going to come out in a PR battle with. Um, one of their players, um, so it, it's a hard one. It's, but he he certainly clearly feels aggrieved, mm. um, which is I think you know in all honesty, um, you know NZR probably don't want him feeling that way. You know they, they are pretty respectful of, of um, you know ex All Blacks and and making sure that they're you know heard and looked after. So um, you know that there's n- nothing saying that they haven't reached out to him after those comments either. Mm. New Zealanders don't do this. It's just not how we roll in the most part, is it? You you move on, you bury it deep inside, bottle it up, and maybe let it out over a couple of beers to it's a not, mate, but you don't do it on social media. It's not necessarily um, the right thing either. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it's... I'd, I'd love to see him back, though. Yeah. I, I really would. Mm. He, he is... Because like, like Bryn said, and, and, and we are a rugby analysis show as well but what you know with his ability to get over the gain line is one thing but his ability to run that line consistently that down line that potentially gets him over the gain line but it opens up opportunities because he tra- attracts two or three defenders and that's you know it's such a massive attacking weapon and threat um, but then it's balanced with you know tactical kicking but like we highlighted it I don't know a number of years two years ago or a year ago um, he was clearly trying to work on that part of his game and his Hurricanes performances. And was having success. He was. Which is why I agree that he was hard done by, because he should have been there and the All Blacks needed him. And in hindsight, that's probably easy to say, but you look back at it in hindsight, it's probably true. Yeah. 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 
And at the same time, you know, if you're feeling like, you know, he, he's in the post DC was from 2017 to the time that he left. So that's a long time that he felt that he was playing at a, at a high level and being able to, you know, thinking that he was, you know, you know, having opportunities that, that he wasn't getting and he felt that he deserved it. But, you know, the biggest thing, I think we talked about it when he left, he was making those those little improvements, those little adjustments that he needed to do as a second five. We knew that he was a great ball carrier, but there were times that he was putting crossfield kicks, um, you know, attacking kicks, little kicks, long kicks. His distribution game was getting a lot better. And so, um, you know, it's hard to say because like, if you're doing four years and you feel like you're not getting, you need to be happy. And you need to be able to have um, happiness and being able to feel like you're enjoying your rugby. And he probably felt that he wasn't enjoying his rugby and wasn't getting what he deserved. And so he went to stop and say, you know, he might feel that he's gone a year over there and he might want to change his decision and say, you know what, I want to come back and try um, earn the All Black jersey. But um, yeah, did a, obviously doing a bit of airing your bit of dirty laundry isn't isn't great, but um, it comes back to he cares and he wanted to put it put it out there that um, he wasn't happy. And um, you know, hopefully for us as New Zealand fans. We'd love to see him back, um, definitely for the Hurricanes and you know, whatever that looks like moving forward. Yeah, yeah. It'd be an interesting negotiation if they went to the table at this point in time. Now, Nani played under Chris Boyd, and we probably saw a lot of his best rugby under Chris Boyd um, with the Hurricanes on their way to a title in 2016. So Chris Boyd is back. He's back as a director of rugby. I don't really know what that means, but at the Highlanders... Clark Dermody's the new coach. To have a guy like him come in and oversee what they're doing and help out Clark Dermody, that's a big play. Massive. It's um, it's exciting for the Highlanders. Um, you know, any coach with that proven record that can come and help a, a new head coach, um, and 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 just getting, I suppose, their roles and responsibilities really clear before the season starts and when pressure comes on, because I think that's where it'll be critical that they just trust each other to stay. And, and what was agreed pre-season, um, I think it can be really powerful for that club. A director of rugby, you know, is, is that a coach? Is that an administrator? What do you know about what a director of rugby does, Bryn? Um, I'm not too sure if he's going to be more hands-on, because like, wasn't Warren Gatlin, he was director of rugby for the Chiefs mm. with, uh, under Clayton. So um, I'm not too sure, but you know, you'd like to think that he'd have some form of like, um, coaching within within the group, and I guess what the, the things that Boydie does, you know, I was coached him within under twenties, is that he's got a good ability to be able to understand young players. And you look at the signings that the Highlanders have made; they've made an investment in the young players coming through their academy system. And so, um, anytime you can bring a guy like Chris Boyd, who's spent time at the under twenties and even the New Zealand schools level, and understanding these young guys and what makes them tick, um, having a guy like Boydie who can come in and develop those guys and under, and talk to them, um, it just adds more growth in that. And that coaching staff so um he's a great rugby mind i remember even though it was 10 years ago um, he's got a great way of looking at the game um you know whether it be attacking and seeing space or having those conversations uh, individually to improve your game um it's a great it's a great pickup for the hollanders and um it'll be great for the organization moving forward what i like about chris boyd and i had a little bit of dealing with him when i lived in wellington and worked as a journo down there is he is straight up and down you know and it causes problems with NZR sometimes because he just says what he thinks, but he is straight up and down. And I would imagine in that kind of role, it could really help an organisation get to where it needs to go because you'd be having those really hard conversations. Yeah, and I, I, look, I think he'll be across the whole, you know, ecosystem as such, you know, like from Talent ID to Highlanders Pathways, which is, you know, they've got a, a setup down there that's working really well with Kane Jury, but... Um, it's then having that wider relationship with Otago and Southland um, and making it clear that they understand what the pathway and their role is and, and that. Then it's you know mentoring and supporting the coaches. Um, that may be hands-on on the grass in a specific area or it may be um, just as a guiding influence. And then obviously in terms of dealing with um, you know sort of sponsor and commercial obligations so that those coaches um, and potentially I suppose um, board discussions it leaves those coaches just to focus on rugby and really nail down what they needed to do week to week. Um, but I think every director of rugby role is normally bespoke to what the environment needs. Mm. And, uh, and that's why I just think as, as long as they set out those roles and responsibilities really clear from the start. And, and the key is, is one thing, setting them out, but staying true to them, saying we planned this for a reason, we, we spoke about it for this way, so when the pressure comes on, we don't you know, try and change it. Unless they change it and involve it together. 
Mm. It's good for New Zealand rugby. You mentioned Warren Gatlin. We're talking about Chris Boyd. The brain drain is being reversed a little, and that's good. Absolutely. Um, but the experience coaches get, like, sometimes it's like, oh, you know, the more coaches are leaving, but, you know, it's experience that the coaches get can almost bring them back um, and, and make them a more complete coach and seeing the game in a different way. So um, that overseas experience, although we don't um, necessarily want it, when they do come back, they are better coaches for it. This has really been the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. We've had a serious New Zealand focus for this episode. <laughs> We've been talking about every team under the sun for a few weeks now. This has been a serious, serious New Zealand episode. Let's have a look instead at the Australia versus Argentina game, eh? In Mendoza, the other opening match of the Rugby Championship. How do you see that panning out considering the results against England and Scotland during the last little series? Yeah, look, I, I think um, one area that Argentina have uh, made adjustments in, especially against Scotland, is is their turnover rate. So, um, you know, they they have sort of lessened the impact of what their offload game was, and they're, they're throwing um, maybe reckless passes. They're more winning the collision than throwing offloads. So they've they've got a higher higher rate of success. So if if they stick to I suppose their DNA um, and and have a good kick strategy to make sure the Wallabies are coming out of their half, they'll they'll give themselves a lick at home. But the Wallabies, although they lost that series, showed um, elements of huge strength. But also, I believe they probably potentially lost that series rather than England winning it in terms of the opportunity, especially in that second test. So they'll be looking for a higher rate of execution, especially around set piece. Because once they get their game going and they get their phase play count, they normally do come away with points. Um, but they really struggled, especially in the back end of tests, to come away with, um, you know, in particular, line out wins. What are you thinking, Bryn? Yeah, I think for the Argent Argentinians, I think um, last year probably the, the discipline was a, was a big factor for them last year, not being able to give teams opportunities in, in the 22. So, um, you know, there's probably been improvements in, in the Scotland series with that. And then I think um, the ability to be able to play with the ball in hand, I think we've seen it in the in the Scottish series, that the ability to be able to play uh, when they have that physicality and they've been able to win the breakdown um, they've got the likes of, you know, um, Buffelli and the outside backs have been able to give them opportunities to be able to to be able to influence the game. But um, I think for the Australians, you know, they've made some big improvements. And, you know, they're probably thinking around that um, that English series. They, they lost that. You know, they had ample opportunities to be able to to win them through actually making them having a lot of um, opportunities to score tries or to be able to um, break the line. But the execution, they weren't clinical enough. So... They made that shift in the back end of the rugby championship last year. You know, they, they weren't able to be able to be um, ruthless and clinical in the early part of the rugby championship when playing the All Blacks. And then in the rugby championship, they were able to be able to be a lot more um, clinical in their phase play shape and the variety around uh, playing without the ball, contestables, and um, I guess attacking zone as well. So um, it's going to be a great one, but I think, you know, it's, it's tough to win in Argentina. So I see it going. I see it being a very 50-50 game, and um, I guess you know the home advantage of the Argentinians might get them over the line for the first Test match. But um, that's going to be a great, great way to start for those two teams, and um, see who gets that winning, that winning first game. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll differ there. I, I think Aussie will win, but an area that Argentina could look at that England had success is around that tackle choice. And if you remember when Argentina beat the All Blacks, um, Mateta had that day in the sun um, over the ball. Um, and, and, and that, that caused a lot of problems um, for Australia in that England series. So if they can get that, I suppose, that ego out of it and not trying to just dominate that collision all the time. Yeah, have, you know, Kramer as well. You know, he was really big that day against um, the All Blacks as well. If those Lucys can get into that breakdown tussle and give opportunities for their forwards to go to work um, and getting that balance, yeah, they're definitely a chance at home. But I, I just think... Um, the Aussies will, will have a little bit of a chip on the shoulder. Yes, they have a lot of injuries, I understand that, but I think we saw with that Australian A um, performance that they, they have created a lot of depth that can step up. OK, so in the Rugby Championship this weekend, you are picking the Wallabies over Argentina? Yep. And you are picking Argentina over the Wallabies, or not sure? No, I'm picking, I'm picking the Wallabies. Oh, picking the wallabies. Wait, did he not surprising. just say he's, he's not Argentina at home? <laughs> yeah, mate, said, we're just going to... We've got to rewind the tape. Having them at home is going to put them... It's going to be make it a lot tougher for Australia, but I still think Australia are going to win just. I think it's going to be really, a really, really close test match, similar to the Scottish series. So 
I'm back in the Wallabies, so That's right. uh, Argentina aren't too far. Can we, can we edit that bit and then go after he yeah. said that, please? He did run a marathon this afternoon at training, so we've got to go <laughs> yeah, well, let him light off. on him. Yeah, we'll him off. <laughs> um, let him off. Yeah, uh, OK, so that's what we've got here. We've got two Australians, and then from my conversation earlier, I feel like you're both going to say the All Blacks are going to win this weekend in a Mombella. Yep. Definitely. I wouldn't say definitely, but Def- I'm backing them. <laughs> so do we want to... no. Okay, okay. I, 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 he is so far on the fence in both of these games, it's not even funny. Okay, okay. Oh, so... I'm, still, I'm still backing, still backing the All Blacks, but it's yeah. not a definite, like, we the favourites to go win their test match by 30. Oh, they're mm-hmm. not going to be favourites. There's no way that's no. no. So I, I'm backing the All Blacks. It's right. not definitely, like, it's like 30-point winning. <laughs> <laughs> when I came in today, I just, I wasn't expecting... 2 nil results from both of you in the All Blacks versus the Springboks. I just, I'm actually a little bit flabbergasted. I just think it's um, the optimism, potentially the mindset and the way we think, having been previous players in that environment, um, it's just hard to, you know, probably think otherwise. Like, like the, this is an All Black pack that's hurting. Um, you've had their new coach come out and say it's, it's uh, dented. I just think there's there's a, enough freshness and, and I'm hearing enough of the right things that they focus on themselves and not on the opposition. And normally when that happens and, and there's um, some new ideas, it's given me confidence, clearly. Well, you've just given Ian Foster another year and a half in the right. job. Well, but... he has. <laughs> <laughs> I think the reason, why I'm, the reason why I'm picking the All Blacks is because if we get that physicality and the breakdown that we've t- consistently talked about with the All Blacks, if we get that right... I just don't think the, the Springboks are going to ask that many questions like the Irish did. You know, consistently for high phase counts or just in general, you know, the amount of times that the animation that they had, they put us under so much stress and scored so many trials off that where the South Africans don't play that much of an attacking brand as much as the Irish. So we're going to get a lot more opportunities to be able to put uh, defensive pressure on them, you'd like to think. And we're going to be able to, uh, to be able to attack a lot more through their, through their DNA of them kicking a lot more and when they do play, it's inside the 22-metre zone. So that's the reason why I'm back in the All Blacks. I just don't think the South Africans will offer as much the attacking um, clinicalness and being able to be um, as much animation as the Irish have. So that's why I'm, I'm picking the, um, the All Blacks. And I don't think just because we've got a lot of South African viewers, it's about South Africa. Not, I, I don't think there's many sides in world rugby that can compete with that level of attack that Ireland have shown. <laughs> For a long period of time, maybe you know the French when they're on, they're on, um, but they can have dips as well. Whereas the Irish are quite consistent in the style and the way they play. Mm. Well, there's a lot on the line. It's a this hell of weekend. a tip of the cap to the Irish. It is a hell of a tip of the cap to the Irish. When you look at this weekend and you consider what we've just said, you consider the fact that the All Blacks coach's job is on the line. There is a whole heap on this, and I'm not saying there's not on the Springboks coaches because. I'm sure they copped a lot of flack for changing a complete team between the first and second test. But, boy, this game has got stuff on it, whether it's Ian Foster or the future of Scott Robertson. There's a lot of parties here that are connected to if the All Blacks win 2-0 in this series. It's crazy, and it's going to be a good watch. It's going to be a good watch. Up at three in the morning. Absolutely. (laughs) I don't know what time it is in Japan um, when these things happen. Brent, have you set your clock? Do you have access? It'll be be, be, be midnight. It'll be midnight our time. So perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Not not too late. A couple of asahis, you know, some karaoke chicken from the local 7 Eleven, and you'll be set. Happy days. Probably a Probably a Powerade, mate, for recovery. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Absolutely. I hope you haven't. I hope you haven't responsible by then, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you know. I don't, know. I don't even think there's Powerade over here. So. Pakari uh, sweat. Full of electrolyte. Pakari sweat. I think is the go-to electrolyte in Japan. What, what was it, Ross? Pakari sweat. P O C A R I sweat. Okay. Um, you can send money to us, Pakari sweat. We'll <laughs> that all over the place. Oh. I'll be sure to get 24 dozen. (laughs) Enjoy. Okay, well, thank you very much, Brenna. Great to have you coming in from Japan. Thanks again, James, and thank you all for watching. Can't wait to talk next week about whatever happens this weekend when the All Blacks play the Springboks with so much on the line. Matewa.